So today I'm going to do something a little bit different in our discussion of the scandal of holiness. Instead of actually talking about one of the books that is in this book, we are going to be discussing the movie goer and you're going to get to hear why. And I have with me Tish Oxenreiter. Tish, do you want to just tell people who you are so they're familiar with you? Sure. I am a writer. I'm also a podcaster and an English teacher and a travel guide. So I wear a lot of hats, but not all at the same time. Yeah. I didn't know you were an English teacher. That's new. Yep. To me. Oh yeah. I teach twice a week, uh, juniors and seniors in high school. Yeah. Oh my I'm gosh. In, cool. Yeah. 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 I love it. It's, it's, this is my fourth year doing it. And, um, it's my, it's one of my favorite things I do. I love it because it's so offline. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, like I don't need to promote that work mm -hmm. at all. And I love it. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I taught for years. I taught elementary, junior high and high school. And I still, I don't know if you knew that, like I founded a school here in town. And so I still sometimes go in there and substitute teach. Ah, that's cool. Um, and all right. unbelievably, I mean, it's wonderful because they, they don't have any awareness of your online personality at all. Like that's. Well, I mean, you know, teaching, teaching like 17 and 18 year olds, they are super not impressed with that. <laughs> like they're online, but in a totally different way. And I'm not cool in the slightest. And I love it. Like I have no interest in being cool. I am that teacher that tries to get them excited about poetry yeah. and old books and I wouldn't have it any other way. And I love it. Yeah. yeah. So do you teach? So this is, you know, American lit. Do you ever, have you taught this? Have you taught? I taught one year of American lit and then we okay. hired another teacher and she does it now, which I'm sad about because I love American lit. Um, yeah. I now do a year of British lit and I do a year of world lit. So okay. we kind of have this interest. It's a small co-op type school. And so the kids flip flop, like they're in one class for two years. So I go back and forth with those two. Oh, yeah. that's fantastic. So what brought you to the movie goer? And the reason we'll talk about it a little bit more, you can see it, like I have so many, I teach, I teach and yeah. read all the time. Um, but the reason we'll talk about this one, we'll see if it fits the schema of what I was trying to do, like <laughs> holiness okay. from the novel. Um, yeah, but yeah, what yeah. brought you to Walker Percy's novel? I am, well, first of all, I have no shame in the game of admitting books that you feel like you quote should have read, but haven't. I love, you know, whenever someone tells me I've never read Jane Eyre or, you know, some book that I just, you know, think is a life changer to say like, oh my gosh, what a treat you have for you in front of you, you know? And that's the approach I take in my own life because there are plenty of gaps in my reading that, you know, we're not all going to read all the books we yeah. want to read or have feel like we should have read. This is in that category of books I feel like I should have read. Um, I actually had not read any of Walker Percy, believe it or not. Right. And so for me, I, he's always been on my TBR list. Mm -hmm. And I knew that this was his first book and he won the National Book Award for it. And I just kept hearing so many great things about it um, over the years that I was finally like, you know what, I'm just going to finally read it. So for me, it's, it just was up my alley. I've been reading more and more just old books mm -hmm. because I just, that's where my heart is now. Um, and so, yeah, that's ma the main reason as a reader, just for fun. Yeah. You, I mean, you say it's an old book. I mean, it's 1960. So. <laughs> yeah. You know, what's funny about that is it's not old at all compared yeah. to what I usually read, but I think there's just something interesting, especially in the internet, but kind of all over the place where we act as though like the only books worth talking about are the ones that just come out this year. And um, that's, that's kind of tiresome and, and we miss out. So yeah, it's really not old at all. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, when I met my husband, um, you know, he knew I was a PhD and that I was, I was teaching college and he just assumed that I was teaching old English, like in his mind, mm -hmm. like that's what English professors do is they just taught all these old books. And I had to tell him like, no, like I specialize in 1960s literature. Most of the books I teach are between the forties and seventies. Like that's the majority uh -huh. of what I do. Uh, yeah. And so I had to kind of convince him like, you could read this stuff. You would enjoy it, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Novels. So how did, so what, okay. Why was this on the TBR list? There's a lot of people that won't even know who Percy is or have picked up Percy. I talk about the last gentleman in the scandal of holiness. So I do talk about mm -hmm. Percy and I probably could have talked, I could probably could have written a whole book on Percy, but I'd already done that twice. So, yeah. um, you know, I kind of stayed away from that, but why was this on the TBR for you? Well, um, I don't know if you're like this, but sometimes well, books have different seasons for me, yep. um, you know, or just stories have different seasons and different writing styles have different seasons. And mm -hmm. after the sensory overload of the holidays and a lot of just input with um, just news mm -hmm. and, and stuff, I wanted a slow burn. I wanted a very um, 
just stream of consciousness almost style of writing. I wanted something that was very contemplative and I wanted mm-hmm. something, but not so, um, you know, not action free. I just, I didn't want a murder mystery. I didn't yeah. want <laughs> a historic, you know, World War II biopic. I needed something that was, you know, kind of that matched the the feeling I tend to get at the start of a new year, which is a little bit of a, not a letdown, but kind of sort of just sort of a, a quietness in my heart and just craving some solitude. And to me, the moviegoer seemed like it fit the bill. I mean, the moviegoer and Walker, Walker Percy at large. And, yeah. um, and I'll be honest, his book, you know, right now, as I teach, I'm teaching a lot of, um, in my classes, some bigger books, and I wanted something short. I wanted something that I could read in a few days. And to me, the moviegoer is really accessible. You know, yeah. it is an easy read and it is a quick read. And I, I like books like that sometimes. Yeah, you know, all of Walker Percy's books are very um, about death. I mean, they're like memento mori type of books. And a large part of that was because of his biography, which I don't know if you're familiar with or not. Do you know his biography? Why he would, okay. Uh, tell me more, maybe. So, and I'm setting this up for seasons for talking about like why this is a perfect book probably for this season. Yeah. So Walker Percy's grandfather, his great, great, great grandfather, his father all committed suicide. And so Percy wow. said, I'm going to make sure that doesn't happen to me. Wow. And so when he became a Catholic, it was a way for him to make sure that he didn't give up early, that he ran the race, that he fought the good fight, that he died well. So wow. all of his books are about facing mortality and making sure you make it to the end. That it makes complete sense now that I've read it. I see it loud and clear. Wow. Yeah. He's got a suicidal character in the book, you know? So that's something he's familiar with, apparently. Yeah. Yeah. And he does that. He will actually have a suicidal character in every single book. Ah, all right. Okay. So he he did not want to turn away from this idea of suicide. And, you know, mm-hmm. and I, don't, I don't want to take that lightly. Like some somebody said that suicides are up in America, like 30% or something, like a super high number. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I, I'm around juniors and seniors all the time. They are moody and broody. And so many are anxious and depressed right now. You know, right. partly COVID, partly it's just a Gen Z kind of way of seeing life. Yeah. And so whenever I can find... Um, people from a different era of theirs that say things that they would completely understand. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I gravitate towards that and hold yeah. on to that. You know, yesterday we talked about John Keats mm-hmm. and how, you know, and he's from hundreds of years ago. And, you know, it's like, guys, he was a teenager writing this. Yeah. He was yeah. writing about how I couldn't go to sleep. Um, <laughs> and so to me, the moviegoer um, is about a guy who. I mean, it, it could be written today mm-hmm. the way he's trying to escape reality by living through a screen, by escaping mm-hmm. his own life, escaping his own mortality, not like trying to find meaning and purpose and floating from thing to thing to thing and not finding happiness anywhere. I mean, hello, that is our culture today. Yeah, yeah. You know? no, I think that's fantastic. I mean, that's why I'm I'm wondering, like, how much could teenagers learn about facing in what ways would they want to face death with this novel? It's not like they're facing death, like they're 80 years old or they're sick or they're dying in that sense, but all of us are dying, right? Mm-hmm. And it's how we deal with the fact that we're limited, that we're dying. In what ways do you feel like this novel shows you how to deal with that pressing concern? Well, you know, the character Binks, he, he you know, he he's older than a teenager, right? He's almost 30. He's a, a war vet. And so he's already gone through a lot of life experiences that perhaps teenagers haven't, but he still is speaking some universal truths where, you know, he has a job that on paper sounds stable. He sells mutual funds. Um, he He's attracted to a lot of women that just float in and out of his life. I mean, he is quite the, um, what's the, more poetic way to say he likes women um you know I think teenagers completely resonate with the like you know easily distracted by the the lovely thing in front of them idea Mm -hmm. and yet he is as he's talking talking about how he's interested in something and then five minutes later he's not yeah and then he moves on to the next thing and then five minutes later he's not I mean not only just the women but the movies the the people Mm -hmm. he's seeing on the streets the what he feels like doing that day, he hops on a train and then he's like, never mind, this is boring. Yeah. I mean, I think I think our immature brains that we still have a little bit as adults, 
resonate with this idea of looking for meaning to your just day, not only like big picture, which is perhaps, you know, what a suicidal person is really asking, but it's in those ordinary little moments yeah. that we're really searching for meaning that um, I think most of us resonate with, including teenagers. Yeah. Well, and that's why Percy said, you know, his goal, like the reason he became a Christian was he was trying to understand how to get through a Wednesday afternoon at two o'clock. There you go. There right. you go. And, and, you know, you talked about movies, which I think it function a little differently than the way our screen culture is set up. Yeah. Because if you notice, like, what did you notice, like the reasons he went to the movies, like what he was you mean besides, besides yeah. escaping? Yeah, because I think what he was trying to do was not just escape. He wanted to see like a a, a picture of what life yep. is. Yep, that's right. That's you what know? I noticed. He, he would go and he would pick based on particular actors, based yeah. on, he would walk to particular movie theaters yeah. to have like an event. Like he wanted to create a moment, it yeah. seemed like, you know, and then see if he could find his the answer to all his questions yes. in this one movie yeah. and he might have found a little shadow of one but then he would leave the theater feeling just as bad as he did before right yeah yeah i mean in some sense he like he had the right kind of, he's searching right the whole movie most people who are familiar with the movie go like he's searching he's on this journey where we don't know what he's searching for um but he's on this search and these movies place him like they put him in time they put him in a story Whereas the rest of culture doesn't give him a story. Yeah. The culture yeah. is telling him like, yes, just be distracted by this girl, be distracted by your job, be distracted by Mardi Gras. Like don't, there is no trajectory. There is no narrative that tells him <laughs> who he is or like what role he plays. Right. Right. And that the, there's a moment when he thinks he sees a, an actor on the street. Yeah. I forget yeah. which one, you know, Rory Calhoun. Yeah. 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 And he has this moment of like, Oh good. I'm in, a movie almost like he almost you can hear the way he thinks he doesn't say that directly but it's like he perks up because he's his real life and his uh screen watching life yeah. connect for a brief moment and he starts noticing the people around him and the people the actor and mm -hmm. you can see an uptick in his mood and then he goes back to being depressed and i think that's yeah. what he's searching for he's searching for the story you know the thread in his life that goes from chapter to chapter so that he feels like he's going somewhere he's moving yeah. somewhere yeah. yeah i mean this is why i write so much about the need for books in the church because mm -hmm. especially when the rest of the culture tells you that there is no story and that you're just a consumer and a producer instead you have stories that are saying no you're a character and you're playing a role right like you're yeah. living stones in the building of god like you are you have this vital importance you're being seen which is also what happens with, with him seeing the actor. I think about all the moments in my life. Like I lived in Malibu. I went to Pepperdine for undergrad. And so you see lots of actors. And like you can remember the moment you saw them. Like it didn't actually transform my character to see Pamela Anderson, right? Like that's like, <laughs> like nothing about seeing her in real life changed who I was. Right. You can remember it with particularity in the way that you can't remember all the other times you went to Starbucks. Mm-hmm. Sure. Sure. Right? There's something about like attaching some significance that you feel like fame does, but there has to be something more than that, that makes all of those moments significant. Like that's what he's searching for. It's like whatever he feels, and we felt it too before, whatever it you feel when you're like, oh, there's a famous person or, oh, this moment suddenly matters. How can I have that every single time I go to Starbucks, every single time I wake up in the morning? Yeah. You know what it reminds me of? So I, I have never lived in an area. I mean, I live in Austin where you'll see occasional mm -hmm. celebrities, but nothing like that. It reminds me of another form of kind of uh, escapism or living through living vicariously. And that's um, travel. I've traveled a lot. My family and I have gone to different places. And one of the things we've noticed, you know, a few years ago when we we spent a year backpacking around the world as a family. Oh. And one of the things we noticed is our kids um, after a while stopped being excited about things that we as parents felt like they should be excited about. And it was frustrating to us. And my husband Kyle and I started um, this saying that we would say on the trip that when everything's awesome, nothing's awesome. Mm -hmm. And um, what we kind of realized is whenever we're just living as though life is supposed to be about from event to event to event, and you have that like peak, cortisol, not cortisol rush, that, uh, you know, 
dopamine hit Mm -hmm. and then it drops off and maybe drops off even more, then you really are just endlessly searching for what is the point of all of this. And that's a little bit of what I see. He's kind of acting in as though he's a bystander in his life. Um, The same way sometimes we do in traveling, we're just searching for that meaning instead of Mm -hmm. an active participant. We're almost watching, you know, the point of life. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you remember when he goes on that train trip to Chicago Yep, and it yep. really unhinges him because it takes him out of places. And he writes about mm-hmm. this lost in the cosmos, this idea of that travel can do that. For a moment, you can float outside of yourself and see yourself, and it gives you a sense of who you are and where you are. Um, mm. but, but like you said, that rush is immediately gone, and whatever mm-hmm. that transcendental glimpse you had disappears. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. And the whole time he's trying to find like what is that consistent glimpse okay so this is this is also i i feel like this like went full circle and i'm so glad so the reason i think that it's perfect timing to read the movie goer is because i think this is what your books are doing both with admin mm-hmm. and this one and this is also what percy's trying to get us to think about is what are the things in the catholic way of approaching the year or even christian a lot there's a lot of christian tradition in the protestant church that follows a christian year how is it that those ways of con- not controlling time, those ways of marking time and marking the seasons mm-hmm. keep you from feeling like you're floating, you're not in a story, you're out of space, right? Yeah. You, maybe you could draw a connection between these practices of following Lent and why it is that book is, you know, tapping into that. Yeah. I mean, if you think of it, we do this all the time anyway, even if we're secular, we have Super Bowl Sunday and we have July 4th and we have, you know, we have our Halloweens and we have all these holidays that are arbitrary otherwise, uh, other than the fact that they mark our time and we live in seasons, you know, we live in the springs and the summers and the falls. And so we already know that time works in a rotation, you know, in a cyclical manner that we see on repeat again and again. And um, we always make comments, especially as adults, about like time going fast. Um, these milestones that we look forward to with our kids, they they come and go so fast and we weren't expecting them. We are time seeking people. We, we feel it in our bones as need to mark time. And one of the things I love about the liturgical calendar, the church calendar, is that not only is it um, something that we can participate actively in the present, but it invites us to participate in the church from the past and in the future. You know, yeah. it, it transcends time by marking time. Mm-hmm. You know, we are participating in the life of Aquinas and, and John Henry Newman and all these people that also marked time this way and in the future, because this is going to keep going. And what's really beautiful about this that I think is perhaps something that Percy and so many of us in our modern era are searching for is really and truly the best thing about it is that it's not about us. Like Lent really and truly isn't about me or you or about like how we quote do Lent or perform Lent. It's not, it's an invitation to participate in something that will happen even if we don't participate in it. And I think that's really and truly what life, what, what the meaning is that we are searching for when we, you know, go to our screens, when we go on these trips, when we're searching for something, we're asking God, what is the point of life? And God is responding with an invitation mm-hmm. to participate in the bigger story that really is not about us. Like we're not the protagonist yeah. that we're hoping to be. You know, and that to me is something beautiful about Lent and Advent. We're participating in something so much bigger than ourselves. Yeah. And that, I mean, this is what Percy was trying to do with the story that he failed. He wrote two novels before this that never got published. Oh. Right. And so one of them existed as archives. The other one he completely burned. But what mm-hmm. happened in those first two novels is he was just floating in space. He didn't have a, a, a time. He didn't have a season. Instead, he was trying to write these very heady, abstract the same kind of observations we're all dead we're all going through the motions but it had no it had no place for it it had no um concreteness particularly yeah. and so his friend shelby foot who was not a christian said you know why don't you set it in new orleans where you're currently living start it with mardi gras and go from there huh and so that's interesting isn't that amazing and so what percy mm-hmm. does with this is by starting it with mardi gras he has this uh, juxtaposition between the life of Mardi Gras, right? When everything is awesome, nothing's awesome. So the whole culture tries to get you to live 
as though every day is Mardi Gras. Yeah. And it's only, and that makes him feel dead. That makes him feel like he's just a zombie talking to other people. Right. Um, uh -huh. and then instead at the end when he's, I, sorry, I love this. Can you tell I love this book? I just, yeah, yeah, no, I get it. I get it. <laughs> I haven't written it all up, but at the end he becomes an observer of what you're talking about. He's not the protagonist taking part in Lint. He's observing it and realizing it would give him that grounding. So there's this parallel between like the author finding grounding by setting his story in the time period uh -huh. that takes place before Ash Wednesday. And there's also then the character realizes that maybe the invitation to Ash Wednesday would give him that meaning that would never let him down. That would always be there, right? In every uh -huh. moment of his life. So I'm just going to read this one passage because I just love it. He's yeah. sitting there with Kate and, you know, this is 1960. So also, I mean, they refer to African-Americans as Negroes. So just, you know, yeah. mark that in your mind. Um, but he's sitting and he watches a Negro go into a church and come outside. And it says his head is ambiguous sienna color and pied. It is impossible to be sure he received ashes. When he gets into his mercury, he does not leave immediately, but sits looking down at something on the seat beside him, likely praying, but mm -hmm. beings can't really observe this, right? And he says, it is impossible to say why he is here. Is it part and parcel of the complex business of coming up in the world? Or is it because he believes that God himself is present here at the corner of Elysian Fields and Bonifant? Or is he here for both reasons through some dim, dazzling trick of grace coming for the one and receiving the other as God's own importunate bonus? It is impossible mm -hmm. to say. I just love that. I'm about to like cry. I, I love that invitation to that mystery. Like, is it possible God is here in this really mundane moment as much mm -hmm. as God is here when the ashes are on my forehead, as much as God mm -hmm. is here when I'm going to be on my deathbed? Like, is it possible? Yeah. And I, I love that openness. <laughs> and I, that's all, that's what I love about a sacramental nature to both our relationship with God and therefore the liturgical calendar as an invitation mm -hmm. to that. And just a way to go about life, you know, that the tangible things in life matter, the, the street corners that we're standing on matters, the dirt under our feet matters, the ashes on our forehead matter. You know, it's, it's not because of some magical sorcery spell that certain, suddenly turns ashes into, you know, some sort of thing that will actually do something. It's because um, the God saw it fit that we be in finite bodies, like physical bodies that need to eat and sleep. And I think that speaks into our ordinary daily cry for meaning and purpose that we want to make sense of like, why are we in these bodies? Why am I here on this plot of dirt? And what you said earlier about um, about his writing, you know, Shelby Foote, having him put that in a particular time and place, I'm actually in the process of writing fiction. And so I'm, I'm, I'm learning from some people about, you know, what to do. And the thing that I've been pointed out to again and again that I never noticed before is that most of the stories that we love um, don't start at the beginning. They start in the middle. You know, and so when we're when we're turning to page one, we're actually in the middle of something mm -hmm. and we can imagine perhaps what happened before that. What was the beginning? But, you know, whenever, you know, Gandalf comes knocking on on the door in the Shire, that's in the middle of the story. And, um, you know, him showing up on it to Mardi Gras, that's in the middle of his story. And that's really where we want to make sense of, of life is like in the middle of it, you know, not when we're first born, when we're first born, things are sort of, you know, full of possibilities. It's this messy middle that most of us live in. And we want to know what is the point and what is happening here. Yeah. David Lyle Jeffrey, who was one of my teachers, he uses this phrase that I just go back to all the time. We are inextricably middled in our hmm. story because of course, you know, of course that is the reality is most of our days are Wednesday afternoons at two o'clock. Like most of our lives are that inextricable middle where we can't, we can't always tell the trajectory of the story. We don't know whether it's going to end happily ever after. Like we don't have mm. foresight the way we wish we did, you know, like all we can yeah. do is judge from the past that we've lived thus far. And, um, it, you know, Percy's obsessed mm. with, with Jews. <laughs> so I'm bringing this up for a reason. He, <laughs> he thought Jews were the greatest sign that God was real because oh, wow. no other ancient people group that still survives. Like you don't have Hittites walking around. You don't have Midianites walking around. 
you only have the Jews. Like they were still very mm -hmm. protected people. But the reason I bring them up is well, from the Jews, he learned this idea of walking backwards, like walking forward while facing the past. Hmm. You're always stepping into the future with your eyes on the past because you can't see anything that's future. Yeah. So that move is always in faith. Like hope is, is predicated on the idea that you're always looking at the covenant. You're always looking at what God has done before as you're standing in the middle and walking towards the future. That is phenomenal. I love that. I feel like I've heard that somewhere and then I just forgot about it and you resurrected it in my brain. Maybe, I, maybe I did read something from Percy about that, but yeah, I, that is so true. Yeah. Right. Right. And I think that's why the, you know, the church calendar does become crucial and why Percy's story then resonates and brings us out of this death state to a life state, um, mm -hmm. because it reminds us of that reality of time and that's how we're yeah. situated within it, you know? Yeah. 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 I mean, we are all longing for the marking of time. And I love that, you know, at the time of this, uh, that we're chatting here, that Ash Wednesday is mm -hmm. soon and it's going to happen if I don't go to my neighborhood parish or if I do, and, and that to me is so much of what God is doing throughout our life, what he was doing to Binks in this mm -hmm. fictional story, just mm -hmm. tapping on us. Like, do you want to participate? Do you yeah. want to be part of this? Do you want to be part of this story that I am weaving and telling and, yeah. and you are a character in, or do you want to just stand by and watch it happen? It's up to you. Right. Oh, so yeah. good. Well, so as a final question, can I ask you, do you think this fits my schema? So my, <laughs> my, <laughs> my the schema of my book, right, is that yeah. you are you are having a company of literary saints. So there are yeah. people in this book that are helping you become more Christ-like by reading mm -hmm. this book. Do you think that the moviegoer fits within that? Yeah, for sure. Because, um, you know, the thing I love about the great cloud of witnesses, this idea is that they are with us. They're more alive than we are, you know, saints. And so there's something really um, otherworldly about the, the sacramental act of reading that we're inviting these people that we otherwise wouldn't meet um, to be part of our everyday lives. And they feel more human than we are in some ways because they're telling a truer story sometimes than what it feels like is reality. Um, and so to me, Walker Percy, I mean, he's, yeah, the kind companion that, that especially now that I know more about his backstory that you told me. Um, I'm curious if I can ask you, like, there's no way you could pick all the books you wanted to write about, I'm sure, in this book. So how did you go with one book and not another? Like, how, why is the movie goer not in the book? Yeah, you know, I, I'm i not sure. I think it's because everyone knows it. And so mm -hmm. I knew that I wanted to, talk, I mean, Walker Percy has so much formed my imagination, Him and he and Flannery O'Connor. And so I knew I wanted to write somewhat about them, but I didn't want them to dominate because I'd written so much else about them. Got it. So I yeah. wanted to kind of turn people on to what do you read after you've read the movie goer? And that's, yeah. so that's why I put the last gentleman in there. Um, especially just that scene is so, I mean, that has really made an impression on me. That scene from the last gentleman when um, mm -hmm. Amy dies, it's just, mm -hmm. it stays sure. it stays with me. And, and that's what I wrote on in the scandal of holiness were those, the stories that have really just put their hooks in me, um, mm -hmm. stuck mm -hmm. with me in ways that I, that I can't get out of, but but I, you know, realistically, a life of teaching, I'm always teaching these stories that have become part of my imagination. And I did have to limit, but I could have, I could have written a dozen more chapters because. I mean, yeah. You know. Yeah. I mean, the approach that you're taking, I think in this book invites us to start noticing the same kinds of things in all sorts yeah. of books, you know, because I don't think you're saying necessarily this is the canon of where we can yeah. find our literary yeah. saints at all. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, this is just a few. This is just a glimpse of what it is. This is how I read and this is how I hope we keep reading. Yeah, you know? I love it. I love it. It's needed. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thanks yes. for spending the time with me. I appreciate it's it. Lovely. Thank you for the invitation. I'm so happy to have had the excuse to chat. I mean, I love just nerding out on a good book. Yeah. So anytime, yeah. really.